Thank you, Pastor John. It is a blessing to be with you men tonight. If you have your Bibles, if you would open with me now to Genesis chapter 39 with a message entitled, The Lord is with you. Genesis chapter 39, beginning in verse 1, if you'd follow along with me as I read from the Word of God. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And so Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. And then he made him an overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. And so it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house, and all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Shall we pray, amen? Father, thank you for your word tonight. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us. Lord, thank you for your spirit. Lord, that searches the hearts of men and is able to take the scriptures and help us to apply them to our lives. Speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. The story of Joseph actually began back in chapter 37. Joseph was the firstborn son of Jacob and his wife, Rachel. You may recall that Rachel was the wife that Jacob loved. He had served his father-in-law, Laban, for seven years to obtain her. Eventually, as time went on, Rachel died while giving birth to Joseph's brother, whose name was Benjamin. But following her death, Jacob began to show partiality to Joseph above his other siblings. The Bible says that he loved Joseph more than all of his other children. And to demonstrate his favor and future intention of having Joseph be the head of his family, Jacob placed a robe, a coat of many colors upon him. And the coat was symbolic in that it spoke of the priesthood of the family, the priority that he had within the family. And this coat was given to Joseph. This vestment was actually worn by a chieftain. It was a coat that was supposed to be given to the eldest son who would then be his father's heir. Now Reuben was the firstborn and eldest son of Jacob through his other wife, whose name was Leah. But Reuben had disrespected and sinned against his father by having relationship with his father's concubine. In Jacob's mind, Reuben was disqualified. And since Joseph was the firstborn of Rachel, Jacob was intending to make him the next leader. Now this created a division and a bitter rivalry in Jacob's home. Because the brothers saw how their father loved Joseph more than anyone else. And they would not speak to him. Joseph's brothers hated and envied him. And not only for the robe that he wore, but also the dreams that he had. Joseph, on two occasions, had two very unique dreams. Wherein he was ruling over his brothers. And he shared these dreams openly with his family. In his first dream, the family was working in a field, binding sheaves. And Joseph said, you know, it's interesting, uh, guys, your, your sheaf, they, they all bowed down to mine. What do, you, what do you think of that? They weren't excited about it. <laughs> he said, let me tell you my second dream. I don't know, it's even more intense. I'm paraphrasing, of course. But he dreamed a second dream. This time he said, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars. Let me see, 11 brothers, sun and moon. It's like the whole family bowed down to me. What do you guys think about that? They also were not excited about that dream. The dreams and the interpretations only fanned the flame of their hatred and their resentment. The brothers' animosity quickly escalated to rage and malice. And one day, Jacob's sons were keeping the sheep and he sent Joseph to check on their whereabouts and return with a report concerning their work. And when Joseph finally caught up with his brothers, they saw him coming in the distance and they intended to kill him. But instead, they threw him in a pit 
But the Bible says there was no water. And while Joseph was there in that pit, he was pleading with his brothers to deliver him. And they just sat there and had a meal together. And then they made plans to sell him into slavery. Human trafficking in the Old Testament. A company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead on their way to Egypt. Joseph was taken out of the pit and sold to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. His brothers then took his colorful coat, ripped it in pieces, put the blood of a goat on his garment, gave it to their father so that he would think that Joseph had been killed by a wild animal. And when Jacob heard the news of Joseph's alleged death, he was beside himself. He blamed himself. He tore his clothes. He put sackcloth on himself and he mourned for his fallen son. And his relatives attempted to comfort him, but it was to no avail. He was determined to go into the grave mourning. And this was no doubt one of the worst days of Jacob's life. Yet unbeknownst to Jacob, Joseph was still alive. And when Joseph arrived there in Egypt, he was purchased on the slave market by a man named Potiphar who was a high-ranking official serving as a captain of the guards of Pharaoh. And Joseph's life, listen, men, it was no longer his own. He was the personal property of somebody else. His life at that moment was as good as over. Trying to, you imagine Joseph, try to put yourself in his place if you can for a moment. You're 17 years old. You are the favored son in a family of 12 sons. Your father chose you to be the head of the family and he'd given you this beautiful robe and now everything's gone. And in that moment of time when Joseph is there in Egypt, you're stripped of everything. You're betrayed by the people who should have loved you. You are separated from your father. You're sold and carried off into a strange land. Imagine what it must have been like to be sold in a slave auction. Imagine the lies that perhaps Satan had whispered in Joseph's ear. It would have been very easy at this moment to lose all hope being a slave there in Egypt. It would have been easy to question God and even turn your back on God. How could you allow this to happen to me? Men, perhaps you've come into a season in your own life at this very moment where things don't make sense to you. You're not sure what it is that God's doing in your life at this moment. You may be even thinking that somehow God is unaware of what you're going through. But when you look at Joseph's life, and you read this verse, this phrase that is repeated over and over again, you find hope. And this is the phrase, the Lord was with Joseph. The presence of God was with Joseph. Now, that didn't mean that everything was going to be easy or there would be an absence of pain or hardship or disappointment, but the Lord was still with him. Men, this is the place we have to start. Do you know tonight that the Lord is with you? He is with you. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 43 verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you, the Bible says. Guys, listen, you may be in deep waters tonight. You may be in the midst of a fiery trial in your home, in your marriage, with your children, whatever the situation is. But you need to know tonight, if you're a man of God, God is with you. He's with you. Amen? When we think about God's presence in his very nature, God is omnipresent. The prefix omni originates in Latin. It means all. So to say that God is omnipresent is to say that God is present everywhere. The omnipresence of God is his characteristic of being present to all ranges of both time and space. And although God is present in all time and space, God is not locally limited to time. Or space. God is everywhere and in everywhere now. You think back to the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve were there. They would come into the presence of God, walk with the Lord in the cool of the day. They had this fellowship with God. But when they sinned, you remember the first thing they did is they sought to hide from what? The presence of God. As if you could get away. And God said, Adam, where are you at? Where are you? He knew where he was, but he was hiding. Itching, no doubt, with fig leaves covering his body. You think about Moses. 
very aware of the presence of the Lord and the importance of the presence of God, whether it was the burning bush or the cloud by day and the fire by night, Moses so aware of the presence of God that he was unwilling to move without it. He said to the Lord in Exodus chapter 33, 15, if your presence does not go with us, then do not bring us up from here. If you're not in it, we're not going. The presence of God. I think of Jonah, that man, that reluctant prophet where the Lord said, I want you to go to Nineveh. And he went as far as you could in the opposite direction to get away from the presence of God. The Bible tells us the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out to it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Verse 3, but Jonah arose to flee from Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. How can you get away from somebody who's everywhere all the time? You can't. Jonah was running from the presence of the Lord. There may be some guys here tonight. You're here, but you're running from the presence of the Lord. In your private life, you're hiding from the presence of the Lord. Listen, Jeremiah, the prophet, said it so well in Jeremiah 23, 24. He said, can a man hide himself in hiding places so that I don't see him, declares the Lord? Do I not feel the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord? You do, Lord. I think of my children when they were little when they would try to hide from me. And they would somehow, they would go like this. As if I didn't see them. You're right in front of me. You can't see me. I see you. God sees you tonight, man. And let me tell you something. He sees you and he loves you. He's committed to the work that he wants to complete in you. The psalmist declared, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. If I say the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, darkness shall not hide me from you, but the night shines as the day and the darkness and the light are both alike to you. Guys, you get the idea. God's presence is everywhere all the time. He is present. And when you are aware of the presence of God, it makes a dramatic change in your life. Your worship is different. We tell our church, hey, listen, let's worship Jesus like he's here because he is. I mean, what a difference that makes. I'll fly away. You know, really? I mean, he's here. What's it going to be like? You're going to worship him like he's here. We encourage you in that way. When you know he's here, when you know the Lord is with you, he won't leave you. doesn't matter what you go through. You can even persevere through pain and disappointment if you know the Lord is there. As painful as it was for Joseph to be betrayed, maligned, and sold, the Lord was still with him. And there was clear evidence of the presence of the Lord because the Lord blessed Joseph in all that he was doing. But listen, man, he had to persevere. He had to continue to trust God. Look at verse 3. It says, His master saw all that the Lord, or saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. When Joseph arrived in Egypt, he could have taken several paths. He could have adopted the customs of his new land. He could have abandoned his God and embraced the polytheistic religion of Egypt. But Joseph stayed the course. He was aware of the presence of God. He was purchased by Potiphar, but he belonged to God. He had made up his mind. This is how things are going to go in my life. It made no difference to Joseph whether he was in his father's house in a pit or the possession as a slave in the house of his master. Joseph had purposed in his heart that he was going to do what was right. And when you are, men, aware of the presence of God in your life, the same is true for us. You seek to live in obedience to the Lord. You seek to be faithful to the Lord. The Lord's hand was upon Joseph in such a way that everybody around him could see it. His master took note of it. There was something unique about the way that Joseph did his job. He was a standout among the rest of the servants. The favor of God was upon his life so that the ones who were in charge of him saw God's blessing. Men, if you're aware of the presence of the Lord, the omnipresent God being with you, it affects how you live your life. You know what else? It affects how you do your job. Joseph's on the job. He's on the clock. And he's doing it in such a way that he wasn't just working for Potiphar. He was working for God. Men, listen, your job, where you labor, where God has placed you, that is your mission field. 
This is the place, the platform that God has given you. He's put you there for such a time as this to work with those guys, the foul mouth, the, those that they just party all weekend. Whatever the, the need is, he's put you there. They watch how you work. Christians should be the best employees in any company because they work for God. It's all right to clap for that, men. It's okay. Hopefully that's your heart. And you realize that the way you work when the boss is watching and when he's not watching, because ultimately the Lord is with me in everything that I do. The Bible says, whatever you do, Colossians 3, 23, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Listen, guys, what do people see when they look at our lives? Do they see men of integrity, men of our word, or do they see carnal men? Do they see spiritual men full of faith and of the Holy Spirit? Do they take note of the fact that we've been with Jesus? This should be something evident to those who watch our lives. As Joseph persevered in light of the presence of God, he remained faithful and God gave him favor. And even, it says here, he was promoted because the blessing of the Lord was on all that Potiphar had in his house and in the field. As Joseph began to serve Potiphar and ultimately serve the Lord, the work of his hands were blessed. He was promoted because he was faithful. When you're aware of the presence of God in your life, when you are aware of the fact that you are never alone, that he is always there, you know what that produces in your life? A sense of desire to be faithful with whatever it is that he's given you. Faithful in the little things, faithful in, in larger things. Not despising the day of small things. You want to remain faithful with what you've been entrusted with. What has God put into your hands? What has God made you a steward of as a man? Are you faithful with that? Faithful to your wife? Faithful to your children? Ultimately faithful to your God? And Joseph was also given power and greater responsibility, greater authority because he was godly. Because he was godly and he understood the presence of the Lord, he could handle authority. You ever work for somebody who got promoted and they couldn't handle authority? They just got a different colored vest than you. That's all. There's nothing different. Your vest is a different color. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, well, it meant something to them. This is the gold vest. You wear the red vest. I'm in charge. And they just didn't handle authority well. But listen, when you know that the Lord is present with you and that you are under authority, you know how to handle authority. You're not a tyrant. You're a servant. You're a servant leader in your home because you know you have a master and his name is Jesus and he's holding me accountable because he's with me. It changes everything. I want to be faithful in every investment in the field, in the house. It was blessed. Every investment he made, everything that he did, everything that he got involved with filtered through the fact that the presence of God was with him. I wonder if I, if I think things through like that. Am I aware of the fact that when I wake up in the morning and I get in that car and I go, wherever it is you're going, Lord, you are here. You are here. You are present with me. An ever-present help, the Bible says, in time of need. You're right here. Joseph was able to handle prosperity. Many, few people are able. Joseph was able. And yet he remained true to his convictions. He didn't compromise. Listen, when you are aware of the presence of God, you seek to stay away from compromise as opposed to run after it. And we see that in Joseph's life because the test didn't end. Man, everything's going, well, fairly well as it can be for a slave in Egypt. He's got favor. He's got responsibility. The master says, you know what, Joseph? You're in charge of everything. Take care of it. And he trusted him. And the reason why he was trustworthy is because of the fact that he was aware of the presence of God. Man, I want to pause here for a moment. I, I feel like there's something that needs to be said, and this, this is it right here. Man, listen. When you're aware of the presence of God, you will walk in transparency with your bride and honesty with her. If you're not aware of the presence of God, if you don't think that he's around or he's aware, you won't. And I'll tell you, there's nothing, I mean, over and over and over again, one of the things that kills a relationship is dishonesty, a lack of integrity, that direct message that you receive, dude, delete it, don't even mess with that, that email that you, well, you know, it was so sweet that she, ah, 
Get out of there. You know, we're just texting. It's for business. Really? What kind of business? Why don't you let your wife answer and see how much business is going to be taken care of? She'll give you the business. You, no, you have to be a man of integrity. And I'm telling you, this, this, this is stuff that keeps coming up. And listen, I'm not just saying it from here. I'm saying it to myself. There's men, godly men, who've got wrapped up in things, went the wrong direction, because they, they forgot about the presence of God. That God was present when they were involved in that. Or God was present when they started using their fingers. Or God was present when they stepped in that direction. Joseph was unwilling. The only problem Joseph had, really, he was handsome. Like Pastor Ken Graves. You know, he's kind of like that kind of (laughs) guy. Handsome. Burly. But anyways, enough about his handsomeness. Let's talk about Joseph. Joseph. He was handsome in form and appearance. And the amazing thing about it is not only did Potiphar know that Joseph was good at what he did, uh, Potiphar's wife kind of liked Joseph. More than that. It was more than just, a, it was like like-like. It was beyond that. It was lust. Look at what it says, verse 7. It came to pass. After these things, man, things are going so well. After these things, his master's wife cast longing eyes upon Joseph. And she said, lie with me. Oh, this always gives me the creeps, man. But he refused. And he said to his master's wife, look, my master doesn't know what is with me in the house. And he's committed all that is into my hand. There is no one greater in the house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness against and sin against God? Here's Joseph, far from home. He's got authority. He's got responsibility. He's facing a real temptation. But Joseph was aware of the presence of the Lord. The Lord was with him. He was with him when people were watching, and he was with him when people weren't watching. Gentlemen, listen, who we are in the dark is who we are. That's who we are. When nobody else is around, that's us. It would have been easy, though, for Joseph, wouldn't it, to play the victim. Oh, man, we got a culture of victims. Look at you, Joseph. Man, you've had a hard go, man. Look at what your brothers did to you. You know what? Why don't you commit adultery? You earned it. I mean, really? You start rationalizing? You start thinking that way? It would have been very easy. He'd suffered great loss. He lost his mom. He lost his dad. The people had betrayed him, his own family. I mean, left him for... For nothing, sold him for less than a hundred bucks to as a slave for the rest of his life. I mean, that could hurt. And Joseph could have easily allowed his mind to travel in that direction. Think, you know what? Whatever. When in Egypt, be an Egyptian. I'm doing it. Who cares? No one's gonna see. I've I've earned it. I have a right to this. Oh, man, the danger of justifying emotional or physical affairs. My wife doesn't treat me well. You know what? She doesn't respect me. She doesn't respect me. Huh? But this girl at work, ah, she respects me. She thinks I'm funny. That's because she doesn't know you, man. <laughs> she doesn't wash your boxers. Get over it. She doesn't know you. You're disgusting. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> just keep telling ourselves that. Stay away from that. But, you know, you find ways to justify things. What's the harm in it? We're just going out to lunch. Everybody goes out to lunch. I need to eat. Not with her by yourself. What are you doing? Can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burned? The answer is no. No. You put fire here, you're going to get scorched. And you're going to bear the scars forever. And sometimes you know what we have to do? We have to talk to ourselves in a way that really just talks it out. Just talk it out. Talk it out. Hey, do you want to lose your wife? No. Do you want to lose your kids? No. Do you want to lose your ministry? No. Then what are you doing? Run. Flee. Here's Joseph. But notice this. Man, this is good. When you're aware of the presence of God and compromise comes in front of you or temptation comes to you, notice the immediate refusal. Immediate. It's not even like, well, what do you, I mean, what, you know. How do you really feel about me? No, there's not even a question. He immediately, it came to pass. She says, lie to me and he, lie with me. And he said, he refused. He refused his master's wife. Shut down. Shut down. Cancel. Boom. Forget it. Out of my face. Woman. 
I'm not even, this is not even a conversation. We're not having it. It was Charles Spurgeon. I love it. He said, learn to say no. It will be of more use to you than being able to read Latin. Learn to say no. Say no. Turn from it. Joseph, listen, guys, here's the thing. Because of the presence of God in Joseph's life, he had already made up his mind before the temptation came. It was already decided. It's not like, hey, why don't we dance a little bit, have a few drinks, and then well, I'll see where it goes from here, and then I'll make the decision. Don't be a fool. Like, you said no from the jump, from the very beginning. No way, not even. And then I, he just refused. You have to make the decision before, guys. You don't make the decision in the midst of. I think of Daniel in Babylon. Remember when he went down there? Offered him all the king's delicacies. Man, look at all this. Daniel said, no way. He had purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's delicacies. Too many brothers in Christ are falling. Too many guys in ministry are falling. Because I'll tell you one thing, the lack of a fear of God and the awareness of the presence of God. We need to know the Lord is with us. I think Joseph made decisions early on in his life not to compromise in important areas. And so because of that, he, he continued to make those decisions. There was a, a cemented moral conviction to be the foundation of his life. I guarantee you that when we get to heaven, if you could say, hey, David, that was awesome what you did with Goliath. Any, anything you do differently in your life? Anything you change about your testimony? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I would have been in the battle instead of been on the balcony that night. Man, are you on the balcony or are you in the battle? When you're in the battle, you ain't got time for the balcony. And there's war going on, spiritual war. And we need men of God to rise up in this, in this world to be men. Too many men beaten down. Too many men, you, you know, you're this and you're that. And, you know, just we, we need to be men of God. These are the days. And Joseph had made the decision he would not compromise. He had decided it. And what, what blesses me about his life is that Joseph, you'll notice what he said. How could I do this great wickedness and sin against who? Potiphar? And he said, God. There's a man that has a relationship with God. A man that's aware of the presence of God. I'm not willing to sacrifice this for a momentary pleasure. This is, far, this is eternal. This lasts forever. This, this has dramatic consequences. This one decision could affect the rest of my life. And what some people are willing to give up, a moment of pleasure for a lifetime and legacy of pain. Oh, God, protect us from that. God, help us to run from that. You know, any fool can come up to the edge and just go, hey. It takes a real man of God to see how far away he can be from that edge and pursue Jesus. That's what we need, man. Running after Jesus, running from temptation. And that was the next thing. Because listen, she didn't give up. This lady was relentless. You'll see in verse 10, so it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men was in the house was inside, that she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. <sighs> but, she, but it says, he left his garment in her hand and he fled and ran outside. You notice this? The temptation didn't let up. Guys, there are things that we are gonna battle until the day we go home to be with Jesus. But we fight it. There was resistance. You know, you know what resistance training is? It's resisting in order to make you stronger. The more you resist, the stronger you become. But if you don't resist, the weaker you become. The, the closer you get to it, the more you give into it, the less strength you'll have. You know who could talk about this? Samson. Samson, what a, you know what happened to him. By the way, he's in the hall of faith by the grace of God. Long-haired, strong guy. Remember him? Hanging out with Delilah. Oh, man. There with Delilah, and he starts messing around with her, and, and she is going to hurt him. This was a messed up relationship. It was very toxic, very abusive. And she's like, Samson, you know, she had made a deal with the Philistines for money to deal with Samson. And so he starts talking to her and he says, well, you know, if you tie me with ropes, I'll be as weak as any other man. And then she says, the Philistines are upon you. Snap. 
She ties, he said, you know what, actually, you need new ropes. You, those ropes were not, I need, you need new ropes if, I'm, if it's going to work. Okay. She, this is what's crazy to me. Like, who lets a woman tie him up? Samson was so gone in his mind. I mean, just fall asleep and tie me up? Not good. You ought to get out of that relationship. Bondage, for sure. That's bondage. He's tying you up. And then he, the Philistines are pointing, snap, snaps the ropes. Samson, you don't love me, man. You don't love me. He's like, all right. If you take my hair and you weave it in a loom, I'll be as weak as any. He was a very sound sleeper. She took his hair and weaved it in a loom? And he says, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He's like, the loom is flying around. You know, he wakes up, gets himself free. What are you, nuts? Then he says, you know what? Told her all his heart, listen, if you, if you shave my head, I'll be as weak as any other man. See, the problem with Samson, he didn't realize he was as weak as any other man. That was the problem. And the closer he got to the fire, the less resistance, the weaker he became until... He ended up grinding in a mill like an ox with his eyes poked out. But Joseph, exact opposite. He's resisting. Why? Because he was aware of the presence of God. There wasn't any excuses for Joseph. He continued to resist, and he even avoided the situation. And when it came time, he ran. Joseph knew that it was better to lose one's coat than to lose one's character. And so he ran. He retreated. But of course, right after that, it says in verse 13, and so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, that she called the men of her house and spoke to them saying, see, he has brought into us this Hebrew to mock us. He came into me to lie with me. I cried out with a loud voice and it happened when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out. He left his garment with me and fled and went outside. So she kept his garment with her until the master came home and he spoke with him these words like these saying, the Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came into me to mock me. And so it happened as, he lift, as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment and he fled outside. Potiphar's wife had lied about Joseph, made up a story, and her husband believed it. And that is why it says that Joseph now goes from the pit into the prison in verse 19. So it was when his master heard these words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner that his anger was aroused and Joseph's master took him put him in the prison in that place where the king's prisoners were confined and there he was in prison. Men, please, verse 21, but the Lord, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison, whatever they did there. And it was his doing. And the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority. Why? Because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Amen. The Lord was with Joseph, verse 2. Verse 3, the Lord was with him. Verse 5, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house. Verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 23, the Lord was with Joseph. Man, what a comfort tonight to know that the Lord is with you, that he's with us. Are we aware of his presence. His presence and being aware of his presence provides so much. For one thing, the Bible has much to say about the presence of the Lord. It tells us in Psalm 97 verse 5, and I'm almost through, the mountains melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. Man, maybe you're facing some mountains in your life Man, factor in the Lord. Factor in Jesus. There is nothing impossible for God. He can level the mountains. He can make the crooked paths straight. He is God. And when you're aware of his presence, you realize that you're the majority. If God be for you, who can be against you? Oh, many people may be against you, but if God's for you, then you're on the winning side. Furthermore, when you're aware of the presence of God, there is a boldness, not arrogance. Not arrogance, but a humble confidence because you know that the Lord is with you. And you don't have to fear man because the fear of man brings a snare. But if you fear God, that is what matters. The Lord said in Isaiah 41, fear 
not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. When you know the Lord is with you, it gives you a confidence and a boldness. The Bible tells us in James chapter four, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord that he might exalt you. You know, you know what else the presence of the Lord provides, men? It provides rest, a genuine rest. Jesus said, come unto me, all your labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You come into the presence of the Lord and you find rest there. The Bible says, he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty Lastly, men, I want to say this to you. As it relates to the presence of God, when Jesus came to this earth, he came to be with us. The Bible said very clearly in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. They will call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. His presence, that's why he came. Guys, he came. To be with us. We were separated by sin, but God sent his son so that we could be reunited, reconciled with him once again. His presence with us. As believers in Jesus Christ, men, we have the presence of God within us by the virtue of his Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us in John chapter 14, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the Lord cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. Jesus said the presence of the Holy Spirit, he would be with us, he would be in us, and he would be upon us. I won't leave you orphans. Guys, you're, you're not alone. The presence of the Lord is with you. Jesus said, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Finally, in Revelation 21, John writes, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God will be with them as their God. Amen. Guys, this is what's so amazing the presence of the Lord is with us right now. The presence of the Lord. And when you're aware of it, it, ch it changes your life. It really changes everything. The way you see things, your perspective, the way you worship, the way you serve, the way you love, the way you have relationships, the way you speak because of the fact that you're aware of the presence of God. But you know what else it does? It makes you long for eternity when you will be in the presence of God. The presence of God. Do you have any thoughts of eternity today? What it's going to be like to no longer be separated by time and space? To be actually face to face? His name will be upon our foreheads. We'll be in the actual presence of God. Guys, it's, it's a doorway. I mean, it's, it's, from, it's like one step to, to the next. Death is the entrance into eternity. We are going to be in the presence of God. I don't know what you're experiencing tonight. I'm not sure what challenges that you're facing. We all face them. They come in different ways. But I have learned and I am continuing to learn that it's the presence of God being aware of his presence. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with me that makes all the difference in the world. It's my prayer, and I know the prayer of the guys that are here, that the Lord would meet us in such a powerful way that we would be ever more aware of his presence, that he's with us. Amen? Amen. Will you pray with me, guys? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of our brother Joseph and Lord, the character and the integrity with which he lived and the decisions that he had made and the way that he worked, Lord, because he was aware of the presence of God. Lord, I pray that throughout this entire conference, this gathering of brothers, 
that, Lord, we would be more aware, more in tune, more sensitive to the Spirit. Lord, that prayers would be answered, that when we go home, the prayers our wives have prayed for us, they would see my prayers were answered, that we would be different men than when we came here. God, we yield to you. We humble ourselves before you. Lord, have your way in us. We ask this in Jesus' name.